This is the ZMAR Podcast. Elite Benefits of America helps small and mid-sized companies with their health insurance programs. And now, your host, Butch ZMAR. Welcome back to the ZMAR Podcast. It's already starting out to be a great week. The the kids are back on the ice for uh, skating, so instead of zero to one times a week, we're back to somewhere between two and four times a week on the ice. At least the kids have another outlet, and school starts in a couple weeks for them. So there's a lot going on, and of course, the, the first thing not on your mind as employers is um, the renewals, health insurance renewals in the fourth quarter. Uh, leading into January 1. Most companies are renewing January 1, and it's not even on the horizon, but I wanted to give some bullet points. You could save this podcast for a later date. You could share it with um, your staff, but I think some of the tips I'm going to put into this podcast are going to be really beneficial. I'm going to start off with one story. We just had a renewal. It was mid-year renewal. We just kind of buttoned things up because there were some delays, but it's a smaller company. They're on a fully insured platform when we took it over. And so fully insured are the big names out there, uh, the traditional insurance that most people will get. It's less complicated, um, but bigger renewals and less uh, disclosure um, so that you don't see where the claims are going. You don't know where the fees are going. You don't know how much anything is costing. And so we proposed to move them to a self-insured platform. They are a small, small company. They're um, there was five lives um, employees that were on there enrolled in the plan, so super small, and so. But I, I but listen in because um, this is definitely worth listening to. Because if we could do this, or there are strategies to be put in place for a five employee company, it could be done at fifty employees, it could be done at five hundred, it could be done at five thousand, and it's a different mindset. So we had to go through some things. To, uh, uh, there was some vulnerability um, or concerns and risks that have to be addressed. But just like anything else, a business owner has to go through risk with workers' comp. Business owner has to go through risk with business insurance. Health insurance shouldn't be any different, and it gives you an opportunity to scrutinize claims. It gives you an opportunity to scrutinize where things are going and what your employees' behaviors are so you could address those. Same thing with workers' comp. OSHA is obviously a big major part of programs, but if there was a way that you could implement a program to educate your employees to do better, you would do it. So why wouldn't we do it for health insurance? So we made some changes on this fully insured, moved them over to self-insured platform. And as a result of doing this, we saved them over $35,000 a year and actually gave them better coverage. They had less out-of-pocket claim time. Um, so the copays were about the same, but the max out-of-pocket for each one of the employees were actually lower. And so huge benefit to the employee. The employer's happy. They're struggling like most businesses are uh, with COVID and, and contract movements and, and their clients having to make changes. So there was revenue shortages in certain months that when they were expecting. And so to save this kind of money uh, is huge for that business. And he's able to go actually go back and fully implement other things for the employees and the staff and help grow again. It's creating opportunity for them, and it was just five employees. So again, if you're 25 employees, 50 employees, 500, these strategies can be put in place with calculated risk to save um, lots of money, give the power back to your employees and the CFO to control some of this cost and keep moving forward. So let's get dive into things coming up with the renewals. Right now, we have November 1st in-house. We're, um, we shopped most of them, if not all of them out. We're going to wrap those up as far as preliminary changes um, and getting ready for the open enrollment schedule. Things are already underway. December 1st will be later this month or around the 1st, and then obviously January is going to be shortly after that. So the time is now. Um, You have to start doing it. Less stress. You definitely need to start reviewing it. What we're seeing right now is the renewals are fair, comparable to last year and the year before. Some are just staying right where they're at, and that's fine. Some people are like, look, at things are kind of just cruise control right now. They don't want to rock the boat. That's fine. Some are looking for savings, like my little example that I just gave. A lot of employers out there are that are listening to this are looking for the same exact savings. How do I strategize this, control my risk, and come out ahead? And so there are ways to do it. I'm going to walk you through some of them. The first thing you're going to do or should do is get a renewal checklist. You could create your own. We have one. It's free. I'll have it available on the website. You could call my office, send me an email, whatever is easier for you. We'll get it to you. There's no cost, no obligation to take it and use it on your own. It'll help give you some clarity on what needs to be done and some type of road to drive on. 
Some of the stuff will be taken care of during the renewal. Other stuffs are projects you're going to have to put timelines on, and it probably won't be able to get accomplished by the renewal, but you need to have clarity on what needs to be done. But I'm not saying you can't get it done. You have plenty of time, but um, there are some things that are ongoing. And so get that checklist, start working on them, put timelines, assign people to it, and make sure it gets done, especially from an HR perspective. There's a lot of smaller and mid-sized companies that are deviating from some HR requirements. You need to get back on track with that before any issues come up. We are not HR professionals, but uh, we have access to it, but we have some limited stuff to help give you some guidance on your own, and then and then we could outsource it. The next thing is you got to benchmark where you're at. You can't ever move pro- forward and have progress of something without knowing where you're starting. Actually look through the renewal. Have somebody actually hand walk you to so say you have a basic understanding. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to have an idea. Some brokers out there don't even give it. They put it in their own format and they only show you what they want to show you. And that's fine. There's a lot of trust with brokers. They're trying to simplify things for you. But you also have to understand that it's your company and your insurance product. You don't have to stay with the same broker. And so the broker doesn't own anything. And so, uh, and I'm not trying to be negative because there are cases that we do it too, but ask for the renewal and ask for somebody to walk you through it. It doesn't have to be the broker themselves. It could be their staff. It's not hard to go through, but you need to know what you're, where you're starting at and what things look like in that renewal packet. The same thing you would do with workers' comp and commercial insurance. The next thing you would do is ask your broker to give you a checklist of other markets that they actually went to for shopping and the insurance for you, or put it in the proposal of some type saying, hey, we looked at other markets. This is comparable plans. This is what we're looking at. Some brokers don't do this. Uh, It's a lot of work, especially if they're smaller companies under 25 employees. Some brokers out there won't do this. That just seems like a lot of work for them. But make them do their job um, because what if uh, market shifts and another carrier that's competing competing new this year or maybe every other couple of years, there's something that moves. Make sure they look and maybe they do just just see that they did the work and then not from accountability per se, but from a due diligence on your part, because as your company grows or you get more involved in this, you're going to have to see the whole pattern anyway. So you have to have a basic understanding to so start now. When you're really small employers, sometimes you don't have you feel um, incompetent as far as the number of choices you have and what you could do. But like in the Illinois, Chicago market, like tri-state area, Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin, there's roughly three insurance companies that will insure some really small groups. There might be a couple other stragglers, but three are the main carriers. And so why wouldn't you just shop all three, do the comparison, because you might flip from one year to another just to save money, especially now during times where uh, some business isn't booming because uh, your contracts have dried up or um, people went out of business. But there are options. Take a look at them. See what they look like. Another option for smaller employers, especially under five employees, is the Biden and Harris administration increased the tax credits that are available for health care. Not saying that it's good or bad or indifferent. Uh, it is taxpayer dollars helping to pay for health insurance premiums. But there's a big pot of money already available, a lot of for, according to Congress. But it's available. So uh, you might have a strategy and you'll need to have an insurance broker that's familiar with the tax credits and individual policies to help navigate this. But you could lower your health insurance costs for the employer by allowing your employees to go to the exchange based on their household income, be able to get a tax credit to lower the premium. And then you could set up some reimbursement that's tax free for the employee and tax deductible for you for the remaining portion or out of pocket expenses. And so that can help control costs on really small groups. Even 10 and 10 employees, this may work. Just depends on the income ranges in the household and what the employees are needing and then how the employer wants to implement it um, because um, each avenue will change the how the employer is involved. Moving to even 10 and under, there's more options. So between five employees and 10 employees, usually there's it opens up the door a little bit and there might be five or six options to actually look at for employee benefit programs for medical specifically. For dental, vision, life, and all that other stuff, options are endless. There's a whole bunch of carriers that operate in that space. But for medical, there's probably five or six options. Just take a look at those and see where you, where, the, where you stand. From the 15 employees to 50 employees, this opens up the door a lot. There's tons of programs. You could start getting into some other 
self-funded programs. You could do it at, at five employees. Um, there's one insurance company that goes down to two. Sometimes the pricing isn't that competitive at two, but it could be. But the self-employed market, I'm sorry, self-funded uh, market actually starts um, coming into play really at 15 employees. So that opens up the game, gives you access to claim experiences and information that is easier to make decisions for renewals and, and for your employees so you can help mitigate some of those claim experiences and move them into a different direction and not on the health plan. Obviously, 50 employees and above, it's wide open. It opens up a whole bunch of other stuff, not only self-funded programs, but there's captive organizations where they put um, certain risk in a certain pool to allow smaller companies to join in. Some of those start at 25 employees, more open up at 50, and then some more open up at 100 employees. And so it just depends, but there's obviously huge markets. Not all the brokers go to these because they're not familiar with the markets. And that's usually number one. Number two, it's easier to stay status quo. And three, the status quo carriers, these are traditional routes, the, the ones that we're used to that are not self-funded. Or even if some of them are self-funded with the big branded carriers, the brokers incentivize on back-end bonuses, and that could be misleading, and I'm going to get to that in, in a moment, but, but also uh, there's just less information available to make decisions as an employer. Definitely get a list to see what else is out there. Ta trust the guidance of the broker. I'm not trying to um, paint the picture that every broker is uh, evil. There is a handful of them out there, but trust their guidance, but challenge them. Ask them the question, ask the questions, just like you would do on anything else um, in your business, whether it's office supplies, uh, employee compensation to their activity levels, to any other sourcing that ends up costing the business money, you would scrutinize, but somehow health insurance, everybody backs off. Which leads me to the next thing that you should look at is audit the proposal. Go through it and see what expenses that are there and that you can eliminate or make some changes on. And I really want to just point out, like, CFOs really need to get involved in this, um, even though they're not health insurance experts, but they're used to going line by line trying to figure out where the cost is going to be. If you can't see the cost on the proposal or the uh, renewal of your health plan, then you have to look at a carrier that does. And so... Um, by not having access to those line items, it's going to be harder to make those decisions. So the CFO needs to start making challenges on that. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get ahead. This is harder on smaller groups, but could still be done to some degree. Um, at least having more information pays dividends on decisions. Don't let health insurance just go by the wayside just because it's a little bit harder. It's complicated. For years, we've been talking that way. Even brokers talk that way. Um, the insurance industry taught employers and CFOs how to shop their health insurance, and here we are today, and they're not challenging what this should be done. You challenge it on commercial insurance. You challenge it on workers' comp. You implement programs to reduce premiums. You raise deductibles. You make some progress to help uh, soften the blow of any increases that are on any other insurance product. But somehow with health insurance, you just depend on the broker to go back and renegotiate an increase. So they lower it from a 9% increase down to 4% increase, but you really didn't solve the problem. You may even give your employees a higher deductible to get it down to 4% increase, but it's still um, not the best answer just by moving some little pawns on the, on, on the chessboard. So in, in, in typical commercial and workers' comp situations, at a certain point, if there's high risk involved, too many claims, you go to a high risk pool. And I'm not a, a property casualty insurance expert. I am licensed. We work with professionals that deal with this. So I'm just talking about from a high level. I probably know more than most of the people that are listening to this um, as employers or employees of a company. And it's a situation where there's higher claims, you go to a high risk pool um, on commercial insurance and workers' comp. Traditional health insurance, especially 49 employees and under that are on the Affordable Care Act traditional plans, you're technically in a high-risk pool and you have less scrutiny or less um, opportunities to pull levers to have any control of pricing. It's the same thing with high-risk pools with commercial and workers' comp. Employers, I know every employer I've ever talked to that ended up in a high-risk pool, every year they're always fighting to get out. They need to get out so they could save a little money, they could figure out ways to control that cost, but on health insurance, they don't. And so you need to change that. The traditional health insurance programs that are in place, especially with the big branded carriers, 
are more or less a high risk mm -hmm. pool. And even though they claim that your group is going through underwriting, if you're above 50 employees, you're still in the high risk pool with other people. And that's why they don't disclose any um, fees or uh, any disclosure financially of what's going on with the group other than the overall total. Hey gang, ever wonder what it's like to be a small business owner? It's confusing, weird expenses coming out of nowhere. And when you throw in health insurance, forget it. Nobody understands how that works. If you own a business, big or small, it's one of the biggest expenses you have all year long. And yet, we all wait until open enrollment at the end of the year, and then we think to ourselves, next year, next year I'll get a jump on it. And then it's another year of paying way too much. If you're a business owner, big or small, HR representative that wants to impress the boss, give Butch Zemar of Elite Benefits of America a call. Save yourself or your boss thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars a year. Reach out to Butch right now, 708-535-3006, or shoot him an email, butch at elitebenefits.net. And be sure to check out the Zemar podcast. Don't wait till the last minute. Put Butch Zemar to work for you now. Just a high level overview of what's new for 2022. We have very little detail at this moment in time. We just know that any policy renewing after December 27th, 2021, there has to be some type of disclosure for commissions and fees related to the insurance broker. That was part deep inside the stimulus bill for the coronavirus that was passed. Uh, we're still waiting for details. Don't get over overwhelmed with it. Uh, the broker community is still trying to go back and forth on the disclosures and how we, or, uh, they're going to handle it. They may even postpone it. I personally think it's a good idea. We still have to do some things internally to be ready for it, but I think it's a good thing because my argument to a lot of these employers, especially middle market employers, you have 500 to 1,000 employees, and you have no idea what that employee, uh, broker is actually getting paid. In some cases, they're actually getting paid over $100,000 of service in an account, which is good money. And I'm not saying they're not worth the money. I'm just saying, what are you getting for it? And what's outlined in it? Commissions were built into the health plan. And so you never see it. And so in some ways, some employers and HR professionals think that we just work for free or we're the ones collecting the premium, making all the money. Completely false. We just make a portion of what the premiums are, but it's built in. And so um, out of sight, out of mind. I think that needs to be um, brought to the forefront for multiple reasons. It's accountability to the broker, the insurance agency that's doing the work. And I think that's fine. If they're making a hundred grand a year on your account, I think that's great, but just make sure that they're earning the money that's there. They could be bringing technology and compliance platforms to the table. They could be giving you um, extra HR services. They could be doing uh, online enrollments and other things that are involved besides taking you to the golf course and whining and dining your executive level. But commissions are directly and indirectly made, and uh, especially the big company. And the smaller companies, under 100 employees, it's a little harder to do this, but get bonuses from insurance companies. Um, because even if you get to have over 100 employees, there's a 5,500 reporting that a lot of employers don't file, but they're supposed to get done every year if there's more than 100 employees enrolled in a health plan or if they're doing other financial products. And when they do that, they disclose how much commissions are being made by the broker on the medical products uh, or insurance uh, employee benefit programs. But it never includes the bonuses that are are made. Just a sidetrack story, I was recently having a conversation with a buddy of mine, uh, Robert Slayton, here in Illinois. He's another insurance agent. And uh, he had talked about some of the questions that need to be brought up during a proposal. And this is one of them. What is the broker that you're currently working with making directly or indirectly? And it's a great question because they may be only making $20,000 a year off of a middle market account, which is fair money to have a staff, an account manager or executive and to manage and help add and subtract employees or deal with compliance issues or questions and concerns throughout the year and information to make it easier for HR and the employer. Um, so that's all good, but where's the bonus? Some of them are, are definitely getting a uh, huge, anywhere between five and six figure bonuses off of certain accounts. And so that's supposed to be disclosed coming up. Uh, no details there, but um, again, I'm not opposed to making more money. It's just the amount of accountability that comes into place on both sides, because if you look at some of these smaller accounts, um, even if even if it's a 50 employees, um, we as brokers may be doing a, a lot of work. We may be doing very limited HR, which we cross the line too much. Um, and then sometimes we get into the accounting department because somebody doesn't understand an invoice. 
Sometimes we get into claims because of other reasons, but all of a sudden it comes down to how much we're actually getting paid and we're losing money on the account. No matter if you're making, we're making $20,000 or we're making $200. But on some of these smaller accounts, they demand too much from us. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that maybe you could respect the time that we actually give and not ask for anything in return other than loyalty in your business going forward. And so it goes both ways, not necessarily attacking the broker, but I think there's accountability. So I think um, some brokers are going to start separating it out. So you won't have it packaged in, in in a lot of cases into the premiums. You're going to just get an invoice from the broker with a contract that you promise to make payments and uh, or pay in full. So that's going to be a, a different outlet look for some people because they're not used to it, but it'd be more like an attorney or uh, CPA outside the firm. It'll be outlined what services rendered or what's supposed to be done. That way uh, you can see if the money is worth what you're paying um, and hopefully that it is. Even some brokers will actually cap what they actually make. There's only so much they need per account. You'll see some limitations they cap out. doesn't matter how many employees above that. Um, they just cap out on what's there. And then um, some will actually include performance bonuses. They're willing to give up some of their money, what they are going to earn, for a bonus if they actually perform. And if they don't perform, they don't get any of it. They only get a little bit up front that you agreed upon. But if if you win, the employer wins, the employees win, then you're actually paying more. But if you're winning in the game and you're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars or more, then it obviously the bonus is going to be a fraction of that and it'd be well worth it. And then some going forward will actually start charging for proposals. So don't be surprised by this. They'll actually go in and if you want an evaluation of your current health plan, they're going to charge you for it. We've seen anywhere from $500 all the way up to even $15,000 for a proposal. They'll do the whole thing and go through every part of the puzzle from technology to compliance, the benefits, what's being offered, how it's being offered, and basically give you a playbook and give it back to you. And if you decide to go back to your other broker, you paid your money, you get a third party opinion, and that's it. But they'll actually give it back to you if you actually engage them in a contract. So they'll put it as a down payment for the contract for the next year. And so don't be surprised by any of this. There's some changes that are coming. If you need anything from us, contact our office. You go to elitebenefits.net, call our office 708-535-3006. And if you need a checklist or need any other guidance or just a second opinion, um, we're here for you. The renewal season's here. Get working so you're not scrambling uh, in November, December when you only have days left versus right now you have months to figure this out.